Okay. Welcome to the Global Justice Report, an online production of the Center for Global Justice. I'm Cliff Durand, your host for today's program. The Center for Global Justice, El Centro para la Justicia Global, okay. is a multinational and bilingual research center in San Miguel de Allende, oh, Mexico. The Global Justice Report, an online production of the Center for Global Justice. Uh oh. I'm Cliff Duran, your host for today's program. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Why are we getting this echo? Because we're leftists and our technology <laughs> is so messed up. Um, okay. Uh, hopefully, if someone had uh, had another, another ch channel open, we can get that feedback. So it doesn't seem to be happening now. Okay. So again, you know, this is, webinar today is brought to you by the Center for Global Justice. Uh, this is, we are diverted, uh, devoted to research and learning for a better world and empowering a solidarity economy. Due to the pandemic, we've discontinued our in-person events and instituted online webinars. Without our previous revenue generating programs, we now depend on your donations to support these webinars and to be able to continue to pay our Mexican staff. You can donate at our website, www.globaljusticecenter.org. <clears throat> Today's program, We'll focus on social justice economics. A talk by Bill Tab. We're really honored to have him with us today. Uh, he is author of uh, the restructuring of capitalism in our times, um, economic governance in the age of globalization, and this delightful little book, *The Amoral Elephant*. Uh, uh, globalization and the struggle for global justice in the 21st century. Plus many other books. Uh, he's a frequent um, writer uh, who appears in Monthly Review. And uh, some of you who are viewing this are avid readers of Monthly Review, be very familiar with his work. Today, what he's going to be doing is looking at um, the current stage of neoliberal capitalism um, and the political conjuncture that we find ourselves in and the relationship between them. So without any further ado, let me turn the floor over to Bill Tad. Thank you. Welcome. Um, the announced topic of my presentation uh, is the economics uh, economics for social justice and in uh, I was initially published in uh, the Journal of the American Economic Association. Um, my internet cuts out occasionally, so there'll be these brief interruptions. I apologize. Um, John Komlos, who's a uh, economist in Germany, did a commentary on uh, Sam and Wendy's article in which he uh, usefully um, offer, he, it's a critique, but he lists over 50 essays, 50 essays and books, uh, challenging mainstream economics. It's become a major growth area, uh, not just for left economists, but mainstream economists who understand that their basic model, uh, the basic model of mainstream economics uh, is of no use uh, either to understand the world really or to change it, which is what many of us are interested in. So I thought what I would do is frame the, 
present we're living through, the current period in history, in an intermediate level analysis, that is looking at social structures of accumulation um, and looking at what one political scientist called political time. Uh, political time is from when a innovative president, you can think of FDR uh, as many of us would, or you could think of Ronald Reagan as some other people uh, might, and for 30, 40 years after the innovative president comes in, pretty much the presidents of both parties are caught within the time of FDR. And so that even Dwight D. Eisenhower had to do many fairly uh, to help workers, uh, remarkable things. Um, and then you get towards the end of it, um, people like Carter, and you get the falling apart of a social structure. The social structure is cultural, political, it's domestic, it's international. It has norms and rules. Uh, it has relations between workers and bosses, between citizens and the state. And these change as we went from this post-war period of national Keynesianism, of active government, of welfare state programs, to a period of global neoliberalism, which comes in in political time with Ronald Reagan and continues so that you have so-called, well, you have Democrats like the Clintons, Obama, who basically don't challenge Reagan economics. Uh, they carry out their policies, incremental, small change, but don't question the assumptions of uh, big government is bad, government as we know it is over, says uh, President uh, Clinton. Obama in his memoirs recently said, well, maybe he should have been uh, more uh, active, but you know, um, it was hard because the times were conservative and he really didn't have much freedom. That is to say, he was caught in Reagan time. All right, now we get a president who nobody expected um, and Mr. Trump comes in at a time that was the only time a man like Trump could become president. He was a joke. Uh, he, 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 <laughs> He, he, he was a, a sexist, racist idiot um, who made money only because his father bailed out his bankruptcies. And he ends up president. Really of Reagan time. You remember Reagan, morning in America, optimistic, everything is looking great. And you, come in with it's all falling apart. In 2008, we get a major financial crisis and the government saves the banks and Wall Street while it basically screws ordinary Americans who lose their jobs, their homes, their future. And in 2020, uh, we do get COVID, which is blamed for the big downturn. But most Many economists, including uh, folks in the financial industry, expected a second downturn because the risk that the financial system imposes on the rest of the economy now is such that you get bubbles, real estate bubbles, uh, stock bubbles, and then they collapse. When they collapse, uh, the economy goes into crisis. And the problem is the government solves the problem by restoring the system as it was before the crisis. So the banks are bailed out and the financial capitalism, the globalized system of production is reestablished. Well, it's getting harder to do that. For one thing, the next financial crisis will require such a bailout that it's not clear they can do it. Globalization has been interrupted and the weaknesses of the supply chains are now visible to everybody. And 
the income distribution is now becoming so unequal that ordinary people see the American dream is not real for them, uh, that we live in a plutocracy and so on. This was true and has been true in Reagan time so that not only Reagan, of course, cutting taxes for the very rich, but Clinton, uh, garnered 45% of the increase in disposable income for the whole country. 1%, 1%, 45% of all the increase in income in the 1990s under Clinton. In the 2000s, under George W. Bush, the 1% received 73% of the increase in income. When Obama, when Barack Obama left office, the 1% had received more than the bottom. 90% in the increased wealth that accumulated to them while Mr. Obama was president. So this incredible uh, concentration of income at the top in security for most Americans uh, is now the current economic picture. Into this comes Mr. Biden. Now, this is pretty funny. Uh, Mr. Bri Biden was called in a in a book written about him just before the election, Yesterday's Man. And it appeared to most of us he was yesterday's man. He was old style democratic politics. Uh, you remember with Anita Hill uh, and the Clarence Thomas hearings where Biden was just a total, um, it's hard to, sexes is hardly strong enough, uh, his criminal, uh, he, the Clintons, that these black people should be thrown in jail. Uh, you get all of this. So Clinton, Obama, and now you'd expect Biden to continue, but he doesn't. He doesn't. Biden and the Democrats around him understand that unless they build the working class this can actually help ordinary people, the Republicans will finish them off. And what they will bring in is maybe an end of democracy itself. We've watched this in authoritarian countries around the world, in India, in Poland, uh, in Brazil. The people who are being elected, democratically elected, are in a sense fascists. They're um, hard right. Or they have their own reality, which has nothing to do with the, re the reality people have. And Donald Trump and a figure like Donald Trump very well could come back in again in 2024. They would complete preventing uh, people who tend to vote Democratic, groups that tend to vote Democratic from voting at all. Uh, jail people who try and count votes honestly and so on. So the question is, where does this come from and what does it mean? Well, there are different ways of dealing with it. One is in terms of who the right wing is. That data from uh, 2016, just before uh, the 2016 election where Trump was elected, the American National Election Studies, which are the gold standard among political science of opinion, what, what Americans think, they did a survey and they found out that more than a third of white Americans embraced authoritarian populism. That is, a fifth of the people thought that Trump should shut down Congress, 20%. Trump should just shut down Congress. Uh, twice as many, 38%, believes their circumstances were an unelected government of the sort that Mr. Trump wanted uh, after he lost in 2020. 
preference government. About half of uh, white Americans gave the opinion that the media has too much freedom to express political views. Uh, this whole idea of the mainstream media as being basically dishonest, communist, uh, socialist, whatever, uh, sets you up for the, 20, the 2020 elections where Larry Bartels, a political scientist, looked at surveys in 2020 of the number of Republicans endorsing statements that involve anti-democratic norms. These include respect for law and the outcome of elections, uh, and they reject that for force, using force to have the kind of society they want. Uh, this is brought about in part by racism, where the fear of a majority minority America, where most Americans very soon will be non-white. It is assumed in that kind of thinking that all non-whites are alike and that whites will then be discriminated against like uh, blacks and uh, Hispanics and others have been. And you have the support of white males who are violent, are willing to go into the Capitol and overthrow the government uh, if they can. Another 2020 poll showed, and this one uh, was done by the Public Religion Research Institute, and they studied Fox News viewers. And as you might suspect, only 36% of white viewers thought that black people faced prejudice in America. They didn't think there was discrimination against people. 73% of people watching Fox. So you have this proto-fascist kind of thing. And after years of hearing leftists talk about fascism and insulting people, calling them fascists and so on, one hesitates to use the term. So I went and looked at what is probably the best treatment of fascism, a book published in 2004, well, well before Mr. Trump came on the scene, in which Robert Paxton, the author of, of the book, defined fascism as a form of political behavior marked by obsessive preoccupation with community decline, humiliation, or victimhood, and by compensatory cults of unity, energy, and purity. Uh, this, of course, was uh, Weimar Germany and the rise of Hitler, where having lost World War I um, and in the middle of a economic crisis uh, with living standards falling, uh, we get the rise of Nazis, uh, Nazism in Germany. And the stress on not the historic specificity of Germany, but on the behavior, the obsessive behavior, concentration on decline, community decline, national decline. And if we look at where Trump voters are, they're in parts of America where the economy has declined, where young people are leaving, where these are depressed areas. However, I wanna say very quickly that most Trump voters are not in fact working class people who've lost um, their jobs and so on. Uh, their income's actually higher than the average voter. Um, and what is it? people in the communities uh, don't have the money they used to. And uh, so the uh, business businesses aren't doing well, the professionals aren't doing well, and so on. If you look at who was in Washington on January 6th, occupying the Capitol with all these fancy expensive guns who had flown in, uh, not many people could afford uh, to stay in hotels and take part in that 
And when we look at the income of those people, again, it's much higher uh, than average working class people. Um, it does tend, they do tend to be people without a college education, but many, uh, I mean, only about 35, 40% now of Americans have a college degree. So many people who are fairly well off don't have a college degree. Um, they're in business, uh, they're, they're contractors, uh, they're what uh, in old fashioned terms, petty bourgeoisie, uh, and they tend to be in alliance with religious reactionaries uh, who again, um, Christianity is, is declining, people are leaving churches, uh, evangelicals are having trouble with their youngsters and uh, they see this decline going on and are frightened by it. And so the mass-based parties you're seeing, not just in the US but elsewhere, have this sense of decline and um, it speaks, Paxton's book, again, uh, published in 2004, speaks to our moment and Biden leading an effort which has the support of some factions of capital, some important factions of capital, and of course is opposed by others. That the deal that Trump had made was he would deregulate, he'd lower taxes on the rich and corporations would support him. However, by the 2020 election, changing. They see crude racism as holding back the growth of the society. An aging white population is not their workforce. Their workforce are people of color, women. And it's a very interesting time because you have an alliance now between social movements, which have gotten stronger, have organized uh, for votes against uh, the environmental emergency. Um, the kinds of strength we're seeing in the, in the Sanders campaign and in the other congressional elections where uh, traditional mainstream or conservative Democrats have been there for 20, 30 years are being beaten in primaries and others are moving to the left because they don't wanna be challenged. The same thing's happening on the right as polarization increases where Republicans are afraid to speak out against Trump uh, because they would be out because the base of the Republican party is increasingly actually fascist, undemocratic. So the question is, how does economics connect with this? Well, the obvious things, the income inequality, uh, the wealth and power and political influence of, of the 1%, but also monopolization, the concentration and centralization of capital has proceeded to the point where small businesses getting squeezed all over the place, medium-sized businesses getting squeezed. There has been increased concentration in absolutely every industry in every sector in America. Um, that Credit Suisse found that between 1996 and 2016, the number of publicly listed stock in companies in the United States fell by roughly 50%. That's because have been going great guns. Hedge funds, uh, uh, there was a brief stop in, in the internet there. Uh, hedge funds and private equity with money that often comes from union retirement funds, universities are used to buy companies. The hedge fund uh, or in the case of private equity, they borrow most of the money using the assets of their target. The assets of their target are used as security collateral to borrow the money needed to buy the company. Then when they have control of the company, they fire workers, close plants, reorganize it, cut wages and so on, and um, make a lot of money and dispose of it uh, and 
go on to the next one. So that you're having a different stage of capitalist development where the kind of concentration and centralization of capital that Marx predicted and saw even at the very beginning of capitalism in England uh, is proceeding at a rapid rate. The other thing is uh, globalization, which most people are familiar with, but the job loss is coming not primarily from globalization, but from technological change. That manufacturing is now capital intensive, not labor intensive. So the United States produces more manufacturing goods now than it did before deindustrialization. Um, it's because the plants using automation, using uh, labor replacing technology are able to do, produce more with fewer people. So this is pushing people into low wage service, hospitality, McDonald's, into working at Walmarts, into the warehouses of Amazon. Amazon brings us to our platform companies that require access to the internet, where people, Facebook, uh, Twitter, um, Amazon, of course, Google. Google, people don't realize is a major, the way it makes its money is it sells your data because when you Google something, they keep track of everything you Google and putting together your searches with other information can sell you to advertisers who will then know exactly who's looking for baby clothes, uh, who's looking to buy a house and targeted ads come in on your Facebook page uh, for uh, those industries. Politically, uh, which is uh, more important now because the right in its silo uh, uh, Trump and others can advertise or can reach those very conservative people because Facebook and Amazon and um, others can identify exactly who they want. They can say whatever racist things they want because it's only to this targeted group. The rest of us never see these ads. So in trying to build constituency to end democracy and to create an economy in which the 1% or what used to be called the capitalist class dominates so totally and can appropriate the surplus through its monopoly control of markets is so strong that the internet now becomes a tool of capitalism and of political uh, fascist basically movements. So we see these tendencies and I wanna end, I, I think I wanna end because I'm told I have to be very careful and I'm, I'm going over. And have a lot of discussion that a few weeks ago, Nancy Pelosi said it at a House press conference that the Democrats were only gonna go for cooperation on infrastructure with Republicans and what they could agree on. Other than that, they're gonna pass their own bills without any Republican support to get the kind of infrastructure spending to address climate change, daycare, elderly care, the things that Biden has announced are important. Biden has agreed with that. He's He's um, signed on that we, Biden says, uh, if the bipartisan deals go, don't go through, we'll do it ourselves. We're, go, we're not going to go the way um, it's been in the past. This is crucial, and maybe I'll end on this, because in the outcome of every election since World War II, the party of the new president, in our case, Biden, the new president, in every election two years after the new president is elected, his party lost three seats in the Senate on average and 22 seats in the House. If that happened again, the Republicans are in control of Congress and probably take the White House in 2024. 
the Democrats have to move to the left very strongly because the, the establishment centrist stuff will not work and they know it. So we have this interesting ending of Reagan time, but is it a beginning of Biden time? Is it a beginning of Trump time? The next social structure of accumulation is going to look very different, but we don't know which way it's gonna go. It may be there's an interim that lasts a long time till a new one is established, but it will be established. Stop there, because I've raised enough questions uh, to keep everybody happy for a while. <laughs> well, thank you, Bill. Yes, you've raised a number of questions, and I'm sure that our audience will want to raise a number of questions as well. Uh, so let's go into some Q&A time. May I say, I, I prefer to start with questions from non-academics. And All right. <laughs> so we take over these things. Um, okay. I like questions of clarification. Things I've said that weren't clear, where someone listening just doesn't get it because I'm not clear. So let's start with non academics and with questions that are clarifying questions. And then we'll go into uh, everybody coming in with whatever disagreements or uh, further questions they have. Can we do that? Oh, okay, that's fine. Um, for those of you who are watching this on YouTube, the way to get your questions or comments in is by emailing them to global.justice.cliff at gmail.com. And I will pass your questions on to uh, those to, uh, to Bill and those in the Zoom room. For the rest of us who are in the Zoom room, we can present our questions and comments more directly. Um, I have my screen on gallery view so I can see everybody. And if you want to say something, um, wave at me and I'll call on you. So um, let's see, we have Norma waving for us on us first so and that followed then by jerry harris jerry harris is not an academic <laughs> well i think norma is the only non-academic that i see here so <laughs> after she's had her turn i guess we can go to an academic <laughs> unless someone else can, comes along yeah go ahead norma uh, yeah, hi, everybody. Uh, I missed at least a quarter of your presentation owing to electronic failure. I have my own uh, information and understandings and so forth from which I can kind of infer <laughs> some of what you intended uh, describing the uh, successive succeeding economic, as it were, uh, structure in the United States of the United States and uh, thereby its, its creation of the global economy by, because of its hegemony and uh, invasions and uh, so forth, uh, all kinds of attacks on various nations by various means. Um, I don't, uh, it, it was difficult to understand your proposal for what needs to be done. Your, your, your summaries of what has been done, we're all familiar with. Um, what needs to be done arising out of those understandings of what's happened was left uh, either to the electronic disconnects or you didn't uh, say them, other than I think you implied that if uh, Obama had taken the wheel instead of uh, just uh, uh, driving <laughs> the, the system the way it is, uh, Obama and uh, 
preceding uh, 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 elected people. Let me let me pick up as here. as well as as well as Biden, if if these people would take the uh, wheel and give us the growth toward a socialist structure, is what the implication has to be. Um, then we at least would be proceeding along a path that could uh, uh, kind of heal the horror that is imposed on us by the United States. Okay. Um, the mainstream Democrats from Carter through until we get Biden endorsed globalization. They endorsed financial deregulation. They caused the problems we have and they got the working class angry at the Democrats. And I don't think I said anything that contradicts that. I think I, I, I have I'm talking about what you said. I'm talking about what I think. And because the Democrats, there are two wings in my view of the ruling class. One are the Democrats represented by Democrats who believe a regulated capitalism is necessary for them to make money and stay in control. They must have an accumulation model that leads to growth. They must have a legitimation model that leads the working class to go along with their control. They thought for a long time that China the Chinese Communist Party would be defeated, democracy would take over China. They thought in the United States, there would be growth through globalization that everybody would benefit. They've been wrong about just about everything. Being wrong about everything, they have allowed more and more people to get angry. Most of those people have gone to the right. Some of those people have gone to the left because it's much easier to get people angry and thinking one dimensionally. We've lost what you're saying there. Turn her mic off. I am. Thank you. Um, you've asked your question. I'm answering it in my way. When it's your turn to ask a question again, or to make a comment, or even to make a speech, that can happen. But I'm trying to answer as best I can what you raised. And I'm losing my thread if I am continually interrupted. Because the Democrats are to blame for austerity, for neoliberalism, for corporate-led globalization, we're in the situation we're in today. It took them a long time to understand that. Sanders taught it to them, the Sanders campaigns. They never expected the kind of response and growth of the left in Congress and in the mass movements. So it is for those reasons that a faction of the ruling class has moved into alliance with social Democrats in uh, Congress and is listening to social movements trying to build a winning constituency. I'm not saying you vote for um, the Biden of 20 years ago or, or a year ago. You vote for progressives where you can uh, and you push the uh, middle of the rotors where you can and you try and convince ordinary people of why the uh, anti-democratic forces are a real danger to our future. That was basically what I would have said. Uh, Jerry, you were next. Jerry? Yeah, just getting unmuted. It's good to see you, Bill. It's been too long since we've talked last, so it's a real pleasure. But I read my recent issue of The Volunteer and found out oh. <laughs> you and I are both It froze a little bit, but yeah, thanks for reading the article about my dad and the volunteer. Uh, uh, first of all, let me say I agree with everything you said. It was a really good presentation. 
Um, when you talk about political time and social accumulation, I think more in terms of Gramsci and blocks, but I think the two analyses, you know, are, are essentially the same. So I just want to bring up uh, one point which you didn't address too much, which is the uh, green accumulation, you know, the Green New Deal. So when we're talking about a faction of the ruling class looking for a way to renew capitalism, what's the next historic round of accumulation like information, communication technologies were taking off in the 1980s, I think a large or a substantial section I have now started to realize that the uh, green, green accumulation is their road ahead. And they can no longer deny uh, the climate disaster just as they no longer can deny the social disaster. So both of these things have hit them at the same time, full force. And I think that's what's leading that faction sort of a post neoliberal period. Although that block is emerging I think we'll have a right, a center, and a left, uh, and they're definitely in competition with this authoritarian capitalism. Uh, and who is going to win? There's no telling. But I want uh, uh, the other. Uh, so I was hoping maybe you could speak to how you see the green accumulation uh, factor playing into it. And another point, but maybe for a little later in our discussion, I'd like to get a little more into the U.S.-China relationship and how that plays out in the rebalancing of these, uh, you know, global forces. So that's it. Yeah, two, two crucial, very crucial issues. Um, if you follow uh, the research being done by the world, the guy who's stepping down as head of the Bank of England, and there have been speeches by all of these leaders of world finance saying that the financial sector is too short term. They're looking at returns for uh, two months, six months, a year. The planet's going to be gone soon. Finance has got to take a long term view. And so even the Federal Reserve, the most conservative of these groups, now says it wants to see bank lending in terms of what the effect of that lending will be on the planet, on global warming, because that's a criteria along with generating employment and keeping inflation under control. They're also looking at the distribution of benefits from Fed policy, which up to now have, have only been to the rich. Um, these are major, major changes in thinking for the technocrats, the leadership, the brain trust uh, of, of capital. And uh, so you're getting pressure to change uh, at the level of the investment funds. You're getting votes against Exxon's board of directors by you're getting <laughs> environmentalists winning seats on the board because the analysis is that Exxon is gonna lose us a lot of money because all it has is oil. It's not, it's gonna to have to leave it in the ground. It better move to renewables and uh, we stockholders demand you do it. And the big investment funds, Blackstone uh, and the others uh, are looking and are voting with the environmentalists against the leadership of the oil companies. In Europe, which is much further ahead, Shell has moved major investments now in renewable energy, wind farms, uh, working with the Danish governor here in New York, a uh, son of a bitch that he is, is even pushing a wind farm off of Long Island um, because they know people want environmental uh, measures taken, wants it quickly. So among capitalists, you've got the Koch brothers making their money on the most polluting stuff around, still supporting uh, the anti-environmental movements. But you see the car companies, knowing they have to stop making gas burning cars and move to electrical cars. So 
you've got a confluence of industries between those capitalists who know they have to move on the environment in the ways you suggest, um, and those capitalists who are tied uh, to a, a pollution-based uh, destroy the climate. And that is really clear. When uh, Trump said he'd bring back coal to Appalachia, it was partly because the coal industry was giving a lot of money, but also because the miners could only see going back to coal mining as any hope for them. Now you're seeing you know, uh, the mine workers union supporting alternative energy in West Virginia and Kentucky. Um, major changes in labor where they've been a minority and just crapped on by uh, the construction industry wanting the pipelines and so on. You're getting these changes uh, as you're getting on pol policing and other things, but in terms of your question, environmental, yes, I think that's tremendously important because we don't have much time and there's gonna have to be a united front in which the environmentalists have got to distinguish between greenwashing, greenwashing where an oil company sells off its polluting assets to a firm you've never heard of. And, and, and the assets it holds through uh, blind trusts and things uh, that are still polluting. You see companies that say we're environmentally conscious but they're using plastic packaging and the, and the plastic will not decompose. It's killing fish in the ocean, it's destroying the planet. So the, the task now for the environmental movement is to be much more sophisticated of companies that are basically continuing to kill the planet while claiming uh, that they are on the side of the angels. Uh, there was, uh, I'll end this part on, on just one more thing. Martin Wolf of the Financial Times, he's their senior uh, economics writer, as you know, and probably other people, talked about climate change minor and climate change major. Climate change major is when you deny it's going on. Climate change minor is when you say you're doing something about it, you're on the right side, but you're adding to global warming. And he said, it's those guys you wanna watch out for. We know about the ones who just uh, lie like Trump, but it's the other corporations we've got to watch carefully and be on top of. <clears throat> From the mouth of the Financial Times, absolutely right. So I'd say that in answer to your questions about the environment. Um, ah, Victor, Lauren, how exciting. Uh, uh, Cliff, are you going to call on people? I see hands waving. I can't hear you. Did it? Did I? I can't. Oh. Yes, Laura, you have the floor. Okay. Um, like Jerry, I haven't seen you in a long time. I really don't have any questions. I really just have a series of, of comments. And the first just speaks to the uh, issue you brought up at the end. I don't know if you happen to see that thing, but a Greenpeace guy in England. Uh, was acting as a uh, headhunter and did that lengthy interview with a guy that worked for Exxon as a lobbyist. And he said, oh, yes, we lie. Uh, of course, we know that it's dangerous and everything. You, you saw, it was really wonderful. OK, I, I don't really have any specific questions except a, a number of comments. Probably the most important single one right now is the notion of socialists. Now, for communists, socialists, leftists like us, <laughs> that, that's a badge of honor. But we still have in the larger society, you know, and this goes back to before, practically before Marx was born, um, this, this anti-collective thing. I mean, we saw this in the 19th century, the opposition. So we not only have the economic things, but this is a deeply ingrained thing. And I, I just, you know, because of the stuff I do, which is social movements, you know, I look at these right wing websites and I see that George Soros is the head of the World Communist Party and he's pulling the strings of you, you name it, you know, Human Rights Watch, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And that, you know, socialism is the demon 
run by, speaking of Biden, dictator Biden. And the right wing websites are wonderful. Some of them have him feeble. And some of them say that he's actually out of office as uh, he's there's a body double. Others, he's a powerful dictator up there with she. You know, you, OK. Anyhow, um, I want to make a couple of comments that uh, from stuff that I personally do. Number one, if I'm not mistaken, you have a chapter in uh, Dave Fastenfest's book on Marx, don't you? Yeah. OK, I do, too. And I will love to read your chapter because of because uh, I have a chapter in there too. Uh, let me preface my comments by a quote from a well-known New York. Lauren, if you send me your chapter, I'll send you mine. <laughs> when I was in fifth grade, when I was five years old, we used to play that boy with boys and girls. I'll show you. <laughs> okay, and yeah, yes, okay, uh, and I have your email. Okay, um, quoting uh, Paul Krugman. He once said one of the major uh, functions of economic prediction is to make astrology look good. So uh, I don't want to make any solid predictions, but going back to some of the data that you were citing, and I mean, is the, is, is the glass half empty or half full? Um, some of the more recent stuff is showing that Trump is actually losing some support among white men. Okay. Um, now, of course, even out of office, he gets a lot of the headlines because he's so outrageous, et cetera, et cetera. <clears throat> but I see a major shift taking place. And going back to what Jerry said about Gramsci, I think we're in interregnum right now. The, uh, <clears throat> and the best sign of that is the morbid symptoms. Like when I wake up every morning, you know, I get the weather report. It's going to be sunny, high of 72 degrees, wind out of the southeast, two shootings on our south side of Chicago and one on the west side. You know, and so we get a daily shooting report. And, you know, we see the bombings of synagogues and, you know, beating up old elder, we're elderly, beating up elderly Asian or black and African Americans and things like that. So, but I do think that it's coming. Now, going back to some of the data that you were talking about, uh, like uh, PPRI and Pews, et cetera, there is a tectonic shift going on in the body politic. And one of the, you know, maybe reflecting on my own young experience, that is basically spearheaded by the, by the youth. And for example, I think when, when we think of the environment, you know, we're much more likely to think of uh, Greta Thunberg, who's now 18 years old, and one of the heads of 350 in America is a 13 year old woman. This is the future. And if we look at a lot of things, you mentioned the decline of religiosity among the uh, evangelicals. These kids, they're not quite ready to uh, label themselves socialists, but they did discover sex, drugs, rock and roll, and progressive politics, and they're losing. You know, the point that you made on decline, the evangelicals are losing. What happens to a group in decline, and this is the point that I make, they become nastier and more vicious and, uh, and, and more extreme. But I can say the same thing about, look what's happening in Brazil. Uh, Bolsonaro is really in deep shit. There have been huge demonstrations going on in Sao Paulo, and in Brazil, I happen to love Brazil, but I won't go back there until he's out of office. The latest poll had Lula 20% ahead. If you go to India, massive protests against Modi because of the way he's handled the uh, the, yeah, the COVID. Um, and so I, you know, I, I was recently called the last optimist standing. Um, and I don't, you know, I, I think that I have, a, a, you know, I am optimistic because I don't think that that the right wing can do very much except, you know, play a racist card. They really don't have any policies. It's been very, very clear. Even even the fake news in the New York Times say, what are their policies? Build the wall higher. And uh, I think, um, you know, they're in Texas, Abbott wants to build the wall out of private contributions. And Governor Nome is sending more, you know, from uh, South Dakota, sending troops down to the wall, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but, the, you know, they're not really gaining any, any, any popularity anywhere. The one exception, this was an interesting thing, of Spanish speaking women in Texas, Latina, Latina women voted for Trump. Why? And this speaks to the question you raised before about media. They basically heard or read or saw that the Democrats were mostly Satanist, cannibals, kidnapping and eating children. And there, there's a term that folks like myself that do the social movement stuff talk about. It's called you know, political polarization that when you have a particular view, you hang out with people that agree with you, like us. But you know, the more extreme you get, the narrower it is and the more extreme that thing is. But I think that that view is generally 
losing its traction because it really hasn't done anything. And let me just finish on one point, going back to the right wing sites. I constantly see another person who got a COVID shot and died. I have never seen one, never one comment in any of the right wing said about how the COVID has been dropping as a result of vaccination. There might be a reference to that it did, that, you know, Trump did get the uh, warp speed on the vaccine going, but there was no recognition of that. And on the economy, uh, yes, the inequality has not changed very much, as we know. And the last thing is a little bit embarrassing. I just, I retired last year. My wife retired about three days ago. And since I personally don't, you know, just for political and ideological reasons, I don't really invest in the stock market and have never really paid much attention. But I was kind of, un- unbelie- I found it unbelievable how, going back to the question of capitalism and investment, of what my TIA CREF is worth. And the other, then the, my Loyola switched over to, I think it was Transamerica. And then once upon a time, I threw a few dollars 30 years ago into uh, some Fidelity stuff. Statistically, I'm much closer to Bezos than I am the average American. I think the last point that you made, and this is this will be in my article, that this was all the, the beginning of this move to the right was very clear in the 18th Brumaire because the basis, of the the basis of his support were the petty bourgeois, the farmers who had gotten or their grandfathers had gotten the land from Napoleon Senior, and now they were no longer peasants and serfs, but they were small businessmen who were hurting and their economic system was in decline. So my paper is called Marx and Mobilization. And basically, you know, it will, you know, in some places, I always thought that you'd read it, but I know that you couldn't have because I'm going to be sending it, uh, you know, because it, it just hasn't come out yet. But we'll, we'll trade on that. Okay, Bill, do you want to react to anything of that uh, from Lauren? Um, then we'll go on to, to Kathleen. Before that, um, the only thing I, I was going to tell Lauren is every time it looks like the economy may slow down, the Fed pumps more money into the economy. And it has pumped so much debt into the economy that whenever the unemployment rate goes up a little, wherever the trade doesn't look so good, a smart investor buys on the bad news. Now, the reason they buy on the bad news is they know that the Fed will flood the market with more money again. It'll find its way into asset speculation and stocks and bonds. We now have a situation where both stocks and bonds are going up well beyond what earnings are. There's no relation between stock prices and earnings because the Fed is creating this artificial uh, economy. So uh, at some point it'll collapse because it always does, but that is why the market is going up and the money you have in TIA that is in the stock market We'll buy you lots of pizza in your retirement. Uh, next question. Oh, just, <clears throat> yeah. just one quick question. Exactly what you said was really in an article that Noriel Robini, who is not a leftist, he's a main, Robini, you, you probably know him personally, don't you? Noriel Robini. Spell it. R O U I B I N E. Yeah, sure. Yeah, uh, he basically said exactly what you what you said, and he's he's warning about about a major collapse. Yeah, not a collapse, but a recession. Okay, uh, he's frozen right now, but you back? Okay, um, and we have Kathleen O'Connell who has uh, been trying to ask a question. So let me give you the floor. Um, Specifically, what can be done to address the problem you described of hedge funds buying up uh, working concerns, gutting them and uh, taking the profit? Mm -hmm. And I, I just want to let you know that the second comment Norma made was that you freeze a lot. And I'm not sure you're aware that you're doing it. So we're missing parts of what you say frequently. 
Yes, no, I, I do understand that I freeze a lot. And at the beginning of my talk, I don't know if you were here at the beginning, I explained and apologized. I can't do anything about it. Um, I am happy to repeat anything where uh, people miss things uh, of the freezing, but I, I can't do anything about it. Right. Um, no, sorry. What what we what should be done about the hedge funds and and the private equity firms? Okay, if they had to pay in real assets, and if banks were forbidden to lend above a certain amount of the purchase price, it would stop. That it depends on the Federal Reserve, the Treasury Department, basically thinking it's efficient to let capitalism become more concentrated. Now, I don't know why they'd think that. Um, as a congressman, I know they're giving me lots of money, but that doesn't influence my judgment, you see, because like all congressmen, I work for my constituents. <laughs> However, there appear to be some people in Congress who don't share your concerns or my solutions. That's, the, I guess, all I can say. But it, oh, can, so, it, so to, to, it, to uh, ask, so um, you're saying that uh, uh, some capital, some venture cap, some, a hedge fund that wants to take something over is doing it in a highly leveraged way and that they shouldn't be allowed to do that. So can you tell me, like, how often is that very leveraged? Is that always the case? They were at 40. That is, they had $1 for every 44 they invested because they could borrow it. That is why these bubbles always collapse because at a certain point, some banker says, gee, I don't know about that. Let's not lend to them because they lend to them. Over. It's an interesting noise. Are you all hearing it? Uh, yes. I don't know where that's coming from. Well, it's not as bad as my cutting out. So, hey. <laughs> um, If the banks were not allowed to lend so much, their own leverage is out of control. They're borrowing from corporations that have extra money and then they lend it out. So, and they borrow overnight. That's where I was before that noise distracted me. They borrow for 12 hours. They borrow only till the next day. Do you understand that Kathleen? The next day, they roll over the borrowing. That is, they borrow the same money for another night. And the next morning, they borrow it for another night. And they pay a small fee to borrow it overnight. So they're borrowing very, very short term. If at any point, the people who are lending it to them overnight say, well, I, I don't know. Um, get the money somewhere else, give us back our money. We're getting a little worried. The thing collapses. That's now happened three times uh, since 2000. And it happens big. And then the Fed saves it and sets it up again. They could prevent that. They should prevent it. That's corrupt. Um, they're taking risks with other people's money. And Oh. Now we've lost him again there. So um, that's that's the situation. Does that help? Well, I'm curious as to what, what the benefit is to the banks of doing this cyclical borrowing that you're describing. Because they're making a lot of money. They charge for the money they lend and they can't lose it because if whoever they lend it to can't pay them back, the Fed gives it to them. It buys the financial asset that is worth very little because nobody will buy it in a free market. And it gives them the amount the bank says it's worth. I know this sounds crazy. 
read the Financial Times, read the Wall Street Journal, read Business Week, that everybody in the business understands that is why whenever anything bad happens, they buy stock rather than sell because they know the Fed is going to bail them out and bail the system out. Mm -hmm. the system, it, look at it this way. In the 19th, 20th centuries, recessions and depressions were caused by overproduction. The anarchistic free market would get optimistic. The manufacturers would make more stuff than they could sell. They'd cut back. When they cut back, people would get laid off and it would cycle down. You'd get a recession depression. It was in the real economy of goods and services, mostly manufacturing, in auto and steel and rubber. Those would be the leaders in, in the, the decline. Their stock would go down the most. And then it would slowly build back up again as uh, it re reached bottom and it would start going up. In the 21st century, recessions are all caused by finance. And haven't quite figured that out yet. Congress gets huge amounts from Wall Street. They don't want to figure it out. They're going after the tech firms because people are getting angry, because people understand their data is being stolen and what's going on and so on. They don't yet understand finance, but Lauren is going to explain it to them and then they'll get it. <laughs> Next question or comment? No. Well, let's see. We have Victor Wallace who uh, would like to Hi, Victor. say something. Hi, hi, Bill. It's good to see you. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Um, I wanted to get back to the uh, political situation you were talking about, um, because I agree that uh, unless uh, something drastic happens to improve people's lives, we're going to see a repeat of the pattern whereby the uh, Republicans take back the, uh, the legislature and so on. Um, and the thing that strikes me is that uh, I, I share the uh, element of optimism in the, in, in the base that, that Lauren expressed, but what we find is uh, very clearly in two current instances, uh, both uh, in Ohio and in Western New York, where you have Nina Turner presenting a, a strong candidacy uh, in, in Ohio and India Walton winning the Democratic primary for mayor of Buffalo. In both cases, the leadership of the Democratic Party has come out in favor of their opponents. And so it, this seems to me a striking indication uh, that, uh, that, that Biden and company are not going to do what's necessary. And so we're going to be stuck. And I just wondered if you had any comment on that. Yeah, I would um, separate Biden and company, as, as you call them, which I think is fine, uh, from the establishment Democrats, and especially the officials at the, at the state level because they are in it for the money. Um, an ideology that um, most Democrats don't believe is correct and they're being challenged. And I think what you're saying is right, that every insurgent candidate will be opposed by the party machinery. Uh, you had the thing in Nevada where the leftists took over the Democratic Party in Nevada and what the, what the people who were being pushed out of office did was they transferred every penny in their account to the National Democrats, leaving the leftists who took over the party with no money. It's the kind of stuff the Republicans do, do all the time. Why do we expect the Democrats not to do the same thing? So I agree that we should not look for support from these centrist uh, bribe taking professional politicians in the Democratic Party, that we're gonna have to beat them voter by voter in uh, constituencies all over the country. It has to happen that way. Um, and it'll be people like uh, Nina Turner and uh, 
India who are going to do it. Um, and, you know, I, I give those people lots of money in my retirement because the, the, the stock market is good for me. Um, I give it to left candidates uh, in West Virginia. They're really great uh, folks in West Virginia. Uh, you know, they're up against 40%. Uh, Trump took West Virginia by 40%. That is, he didn't get 40% of the vote. He got 60, 80% to 20%, whatever. Overwhelmingly, you know, West Virginia went right wing. These people, school teachers very heavily because um, they get screwed by the state so badly. But all over in Texas, I, I, if you get on the mailing list, they trade them around and pretty soon you're being... Build towards winning, you know, um, and yeah, that's the only way it's going to happen. That there's a, a two two level struggle: the social movement struggle and the uh, electoral struggle, and we have to be involved in both. Um, the third one is the theoretical Marxists, uh, and we do work that nobody pays any attention to. That if you want to change things. All three are of value, but right now, trying to help real insurgents is just crucial. Okay, Jerry wanted to follow up. Yeah, I think uh, things are getting complex for the left. Uh, it's clearly our main enemy is authoritarian capitalism, which is based on white supremacy. But how do we view the Democratic Party and the Democratic opposition? So. To me, it's you know developing into a center right and left. We know who the left is, right? Sanders and AOC, et cetera. Uh, Clinton, Lawrence Summers, these are still neoliberals within the Democratic Party that have to be opposed and defeated. But I think Biden is much in the center. And I don't think we should just look at Biden himself because Biden has brought in with him a whole cadre of economists and intellectuals and bureaucrats um, who have formulated the $6 trillion plan. I mean, this $6 trillion plan just didn't drop out of the sky. You know, this is being thought about and debated really since 2008. And the Picardy's book really in many ways set off the discussion uh, within those circles. And so, you know, what they've essentially done is adopted the left agenda. And they'll of course be compromises and backslides, but what Biden and those people have done is legitimatize our agenda. Voting rights, labor rights, the Green New Deal, uh, public, <sighs> you know, public infrastructure, all of that comes from the left and our opposition to neoliberalism over the last 20 years. So I think that's pretty significant. And I think we have to see this, uh, you know, more than Biden, you know, it's, we have to look at all these social forces, political forces around us. The other thing I wanted to uh, bring up again is China, perhaps a little more since we haven't discussed about it. This uh, changing rhetoric on China has happened very quickly. Hold on a minute. Before you do, let me just make a comment because uh, I don't want to talk Okay, about it. I'll shut up. I, no, no, I, I think what you said is absolutely right. And um, there are going to be a lot of... It, it, Larry Summers, the, the hero of, of the Robert Rubin of the Democratic Party, right? If you read what people are saying about him, he's so wrong about everything. Forget him, don't listen to him. He has nothing to tell us. You're getting this from people younger than us who are uh, the people Biden has chosen for the Council of Economic Advisors, the environmentalists, all these other groups, that he has no credibility with the left of the party and that the newspapers still pay attention to him is funny because nobody else pays any attention to him except conservative Democrats. So I think you're absolutely right about that. And the war, if you will, or the battle is within the Democratic Party to support 
the progressive forces and to isolate, just as we want to isolate uh, the, the right wing authoritarians, we want to isolate those people. They only have support in establishment circles that have been discredited. And I think the point you're making is just really very important. Uh, now on China, please. Oh, David, if you can hear this, David Barkin, turn on uh, your video. Yes, well, welcome, David. We'd like to see you. Um, but let me go back to Jerry, who had a second point on China. Yeah, it probably deserves its own hour and a half discussion. But uh, as I was saying, you know, the turnaround in China has been very quick. Uh, and uh, so I've been motivated over the last couple of months to start to reading more uh, documents coming out of uh, what I would call the transnational capitalist class and finance capital and major foreign policy centers like the Atlantic uh, Council, the Council of Foreign Affairs, and et cetera, et cetera. And it's clear that uh, people in the financial transnational class don't, don't want a Cold War with China. In all these papers and in all their discussions, they're still free market neoliberals, which means they want this massive flow of uh, money and capital between borders and to China and out of China to continue. Uh, and there is about $3.3 trillion of funds that have been co-invested between just China and the US, I'm not even talking about Japan and the EU and all the rest. So um, where is this coming from? And I think it goes to sort of this um, pol uh, political pressure on the Democratic Party that Bill was talking about to regain legitimacy. Uh, and uh, there's no better enemy than the other, which China could very conveniently fills that role of the other to attack. And there are you know, real issues around governance and state economics that, uh, that uh, they debate. But um, I think mainly the political thing is like I say that China is the winner in globalization, a new class of billionaires, a vast middle class, new vast middle class. In the US, what we've seen is austerity, a shrinking of the middle class, burdens on the working class. And so to rebalance the China-US relationship, which has been the center of globalization, is a way for the Western transnational capitalist class to partially address this question of where is the money, excuse me, where's the money going to come from to where we can reconstruct the social contract. So they don't want it just to come out of their pockets. They want it also to come out of China's pockets. And that's what I think is uh, very much at the bottom of the um, Cold War conflict right now, but it can spin out of control, I think, very easily. I think we really have to watch it and analyze it carefully. So that's my two cents. Yeah, no, I, I agree with, with all of that totally. I, I might put it a bit different in the sense that smart capitalism does not want conflict with China. It wants to make money with China, as you say. However, the point you made earlier is also important. And that point is that in American politics, an enemy is crucial. And uh, the terrorists from the Middle East have been replaced by domestic terrorists. And uh, if, if you haven't seen Biden, the administration has this 23 page uh, report on how to deal with domestic terrorism, because they understand the point someone made, maybe it was Lauren uh, earlier, that um, there's gonna be all this violence, that these people are crazy and they're gonna you know, shoot Asians and Muslims and um, Hispanic looking people and all, all this, you know, destroy the state stuff. Um, so that they're gonna not focus on foreign terrorism as Trump did, because it's stupid, um, but on domestic, but you need an enemy. So if it's not gonna be the Arab uh, Muslim under your bed, uh, it's got to be China, um, that Russia, you know, their, their old hat. So 
there's going to be pressure from the Republicans to, and Biden initially, Biden initially went with China as the enemy. And you need China and we need a peaceful relationship with them. Um, so that is, as I think you pointed out, the tension. Okay, do we have any other questions or comments from people who have not spoken yet? Well, we're over time, Cliff, aren't we? Yeah, yes, yeah, we do need to wrap this up soon, but I did want to give space for anyone who hasn't been heard yet. I still want to see David Barkin. I haven't seen him since sixth grade. <laughs> Hey, there, he shows his face. <laughs> Welcome, David. How are you? Good, it's nice to see you. Uh, Dave and I, I've of course seen him since his grade, but uh, we, we went to junior high school together. <laughs> <laughs> yes, a number of people in this Zoom room go way back, apparently. So. <clears throat> Okay. But, well, I think we have um, we've uh, covered a lot of territory and, uh, and had a lot of very provocative uh, ideas aired here. So, but on that, we need to end with a warm thanks to to Bill Tab um, and uh, apology to everyone for the uh, the. Um, the, the poor, poor internet at times that has made communication more difficult. Um, I hope that everyone has enjoyed the discussion and um, I, this uh, webinar has been recorded and will be available on YouTube as are all of our past programs uh, accessible from our website, www globaljusticecenter.org. Hope that you will join us next Monday for our next webinar, um, which will feature um, Jerry Harris, who has been with us today, and yours truly, discussing is the global crisis killing neoliberalism. That will be at one o'clock central time next Monday. Finally, I want to thank our webinar team, Liz Mestris, Gregory Diamond, Roberta Robles, Olivia Canales, Bob Stone, and yours truly. And now this is Cliff Durand signing off until next Monday. Ciao. Bill, I'm sorry. I'm sorry I...